Us in Progress by Lulu Delacre. Chapter 5, Band-Aid. No se puede tapar el cielo con la mano. You can't hide the sky with one hand. Alina sat at the picnic table in the cool shade of the banyan tree with 10 of her classmates from parochial school. She had just blown out the 12 candles atop the tres leches and strawberry cake, her laugh chiming like silver bells above the applause of her friends when the phone rang. Hello, Mommy answered after swallowing a mouthful of the custardy cake. By the time, by the tone in Mommy's voice, Alina knew it was Papa. Lifting a sliced strawberry as red as her manicured nails, Mommy fed it to Martin, Alina's little brother. He was busy crinkling the bright wrapping paper Alina had teased him with. Gracias for the cake, mi amor. The girls love it, Mommy raved. Even the baby likes it. I can feel tiny kicks inside me. Papa was finishing a concrete patio on this Saturday afternoon and had told Alina he would be home before her party was over. Concrete was what everyone wanted for their patios and driveways in Homestead, Florida. Papa's business was going so well that two years ago they had moved into a bigger house where Alina, being the only girl, had had her own room. Alina loved choosing the fabric for her window curtains. She had helped Mummy sew the panels making sure the pink and purple flower pattern aligned perfectly. Since her brothers Angel and Martin shared a room, Alina knew her baby sister would move in with her one day. She liked that idea. I can't wait for me hermanita to be born, she remembered telling mommy while they were sewing together. I saw this cute hairdo for baby girls. All you need is pink ribbon and soap and scissors, and you glue little bows into small bunches of the baby's hair with soap. It works, too. Mommy had raised her eyebrows and snorted. Your sister hasn't been born yet, and you're thinking about hairdos? She had cradled Alina's chin in her soft palm for a moment before returning to her sewing machine. After a long pause in the phone conversation, Alina saw Mommy's smile vanish. Mommy ambled back into the house, sliding the patio door closed behind her. When she came out again, Alina's best friend Jenny ran up to her. Mrs. Gonzalez, Jenny exclaimed with a little bounce. Alina loves the matching t-shirts I gave her and the baby. Show your mom, Alina. Alina held up the hot pink t-shirts with glittering bird designs. When she peeked from behind them, she noticed Mommy's forced smile. Linda's pretty, Mommy said, her voice flat. Her gaze lost somewhere between the shirts. Alina eyed Mommy's face for a moment, but she was soon distracted by her friend's giggles and presents. Almost a year later, on a humid Friday morning, Alina sat on a faded blue plastic chair just outside the small apartment they now lived in on the other side of the busway. She was trying to stay cool in a sliver of shadow in the parched yard. In her lap was baby Sophie. Alina needed to feed her something, and she rose to mash a piece of the overripe banana left on the worn kitchen counter, which stayed sticky no matter how many times she or Mommy cleaned it. She also needed to check on Martin. At six years old, he was still slow to get dressed. Mommy had already left for work, and it was up to Alina to make sure her brothers got to school. After that, she had to drop Sophie at the neighbors before heading to her public middle school. Things had gotten tough since Papa was no longer with them. The day after her 12th birthday party, the life she'd always known began to fade away. While still in private school, Alina kept telling her friends that her dad was on a business trip. She added new details every time she retold the story, until it became so real to her that she almost believed it and began to act as if nothing was wrong in front of others. It helped that, at first, Mommy didn't talk about what had happened either, waiting for the impossible to incur. Just three weeks after the incident, Sophie was born, and Mommy put Alina in charge of her two younger brothers. Then Alina told Jenny that Puppy had extended his business trip. When Mommy started to work long hours to make ends meet, Alina told Jenny that Mommy wanted to better herself and was taking a course. Each new responsibility that Mommy gave Alina cemented Alina's feeling of living temporarily in another girl's body. It was as if the carefree, joyful Alina was simply visiting inside the girl who was burdened with responsibilities. This kind of crazy thinking brought her comfort. In the middle of July, when Mommy announced they could no longer pay the rent and they would soon have to move out of the big house, Alina froze. She didn't know what to tell Jenny. 
Alina had shared everything with Jenny. Her crushes, her fears, her dreams. They had been best friends since the moment they found out they shared the exact same birthday. When she tried to talk to Mommy about how to handle things with Jenny, Mommy was too tired to talk. So Alina gave up and decided to avoid her friend altogether. Over the next few weeks, Jenny texted and called, but Alina didn't answer. But one afternoon, Jenny showed up when Alina was packing her things. It was only then that Jenny pried the truth out of her. All of it. Alina, things can't get any worse for you, she had said. You've hit bottom. There's nowhere else to go but up. Alina felt stabbed by these words, robbed of her fantasy and ashamed. You don't understand. This never would have happened to you, Alina replied, wiping the tears that had gathered in her eyes. Jenny knew the truth, and Alina didn't want to face it. It was easier to think that none of it had happened to her, but rather to this other girl, the one who had to do so many chores at home. Alina wiped Sophie's hands and face after her sister had finished. She filled the sippy cup with tap water. Good girl, Sophie, good girl, she said, pressing her lips to Sophie's chubby cheek and placing her in the stroller. Hurry up, Martin, Alina called. You'll be late for the bus. Angel was outside horsing around with the kid next door as he waited for Martin to come out. Boys' shirts and socks were scattered about the small apartment. Alina groaned, bending over to pick each item up to add to the heap already on the couch. She recognized some of the goodwill clothes Doña Sanchez had given them, and her brow furrowed. This woman from Nicaragua had visited Alina's family several times. She always brought food collected through her foundation. With each visit, Mommy rehashed the incident and its consequences. Alina would always leave the room. She had recently learned why Doña Sanchez was called La Gran Madre. The reason made her edgy. Once the boys were gone, Alina drank a glass of watered-down juice, brushed Sophie's curls, and left the apartment. The counselor had set up a meeting with her today, and Alina wondered what it was about. Months into her first year in public school, she was still trying to learn how it all worked. She blew a final kiss to Sophie, now in the arms of her neighbor, and headed to the bus stop. At school, she didn't greet anyone in the crowded hallway. She avoided making friends. It was painful to have a best friend and then to not have one. She remembered the last time she had spoken to Jenny. Then Jenny had left message after message on Alina's cell until Alina's phone service was canceled. Now they were no longer neighbors and went to different schools. Still, sometimes things reminded her of Jenny, like the hot pink t-shirts, and she missed the good times, coordinating outfits, being silly, and most of all, playing soccer with Poppy. Thinking of Jenny's ability to kick the ball far over the neighbor's fence, to Poppy's delight, brought a smile to Alina's lips. She opened the door to the counselor's office and greeted Mrs. Park. Good morning, Alina, Mrs. Park said. Please sit down. I wanted to tell you about a program. Yes, Alina said, tucking stray hair behind her ear. It's for free and reduced meals. Your mom told me how hard things are at home. What do you mean? Alina's body became rigid. The counselor shifted in her chair. Well, since your dad was deported, she said with caution, Alina crossed her arms. She clenched her fist. No, he's on a long trip, and he's going to come back. He will, she exclaimed. Alina, please, you'll feel better if you talk about this. I don't want to talk about it, Alina shouted as she stood up, rattling the chair behind her. You don't understand. As she closed the door, the memories of that birthday afternoon rushed back. They were unstoppable, like her tears. Ay, Diosito Santo, Mama had said after the girls left. She had sat next to Alina on the picnic table bench amid the wrapping paper, the ribbons, and the gifts. Oh, my God, your father. He was pulled over by the police on his way home because the van's registration was expired. They took him into custody, and then they called La Migra. Immigration, Alina thought. I thought that completely silenced Mama's words giving way to the numbness that drained all the joy she had been filled with moments before. In this void grew a knot in her stomach and an ache in her heart. That was the beginning of the crazy thinking, where she imagined herself in some sort of nightmare from which she would wake up one day. But 11 months later, she still hadn't, and reality started to sink in as she walked the empty hallways back to her classroom. Alina was in such a daze the remainder of her school day that she missed the school bus and had to walk back home the seven long blocks. At every corner she saw something that reminded her of her dad 
and the big void he had left. There was the hardware store where he sometimes picked up day laborers. There was the copy place where Alina and Poppy printed flyers to promote his business, which she and Jenny distrib distributed around the neighborhood. As she reached Rita's bakery, Alina stopped at the sight of the Tres Leches cake displayed in the window. The corners of her mouth dropped and the numbness returned. Ahead of her, she saw the long shadows of the buildings and knew it was later than usual. She was going to be late to pick up Sophie. It wouldn't be the first time either. Maybe Mommy would be late getting home and wouldn't notice. Upon approaching the apartment building, Alina crossed paths with Doña Sanchez, who waved at her from her car before turning onto the main road. She saw Mommy in the distance, seated on the steps outside their apartment, with Sophie on her lap, busy chatting with a short woman Alina had not seen before. Sophie wriggled down from Mommy's arms and chased after a sparrow, hopping on the grass. After a few steps, Sophie stumbled and fell to the ground, giggling and clapping her little hands. Alina joined Sophie and caught part of the conversation between Mommy and the other woman. I'm giving La Gran Madre guardianship. I trust her, said the woman. Next Saturday at the ranch. There's a notary, too. Since my husband was deported and two of my friends at work were detained by La Migra, I've been worried sick. My kids are citizens. They have a real chance. If I'm deported, they can still stay here living with my cousins, with Doña Sanchez as the legal guardian. Si, sí, si, sí, entiendo. Mommy nodded, her eyebrows drawn together in concern. I understand. It's like what happened to us. Hola, Alina. Mommy greeted her. Please put away the things our friend Doña Sanchez brought. Mommy leaned closer to the woman, engrossed in her story. Alina glared at Mommy, lifted up her little sister, and went inside. In the evening after the boys and Sophie were asleep, Mommy grabbed Alina by the arm. We need to talk, Mommy said, her worn hands sorting the laundry from the laundromat. Next Saturday, we are going to La Gran Madre's barbecue. I think we need her help, but I wanted to talk to you about it first. Alina knew what Mommy was going to say, but couldn't wrap her thoughts around it. She knew why this woman from Nicaragua was called La Gran Madre. Many parents with American children who had entered illegally and feared deportation sought her help. Doña Sanchez had become the legal guardian of more than 800 young American citizens. People said she did it because kind strangers had helped her when she arrived at 17, seeking refuge herself. To Alina, it seemed impossible to be able to take care of so many children. Alina knew how hard it was to care for only three. I'm thinking of granting custody to Doña Sanchez, Mommy continued, slumping on the sofa with a wrinkled shirt on her lap. Why are you saying that? Am I not good enough help for you? Alina blurted out, sitting next to Mummy. Is it because I sometimes pick up Sophie late? Like today? But no, Linda, no, Mommy said, reaching for Alina's chin. It's not that. She tilted her head down. I'm afraid I could be detained and deported, and you kids would be split up in foster care. I've heard horrible stories about that. If you're deported, we'll go with you, pleaded Alina. We're not splitting up. We could even join Poppy in Honduras, she added, trying to lighten the fear with hope. You don't know what you're saying, Mommy shook her head, rubbing her temples with both hands. Gangs rule the streets in San Pedro Sula. I can't do that to all of you. That night, Alina couldn't sleep. She thought that if Mommy gave Doña Sanchez custody, it might make, make Mommy less afraid of being caught by La Migra. And if Mommy was deported, how was Alina going to provide for her siblings? Was it true that they could all get split up and handed over to different foster families? She could not imagine being apart from her brothers and sister. Maybe if she were better helper to Mommy, Mommy wouldn't think of granting custody to Doña Sanchez. Alina was scared, and fear forced Alina to peek out of the fog in which she lived. This was her life, and it sucked. She missed talking to Jenny. All week, Alina was on time to pick up Sophie. She did extra chores at home. She mopped the kitchen floor, started dinner, and helped her brothers with homework. So Mommy returned from work to find everything in order. On Thursday, Alina found $3 deep inside one of the pockets of her backpack and decided to buy cans of beans and coconut milk at the dollar store to make resan beansi. Alina hoped that the special rice and beans dish would help convince Mommy not to go to the Saturday event. Friday afternoon, when she went to pick up Sophie, the neighbors gave Alina some cilantro and garlic for her dish. 
At home with Sophie playing inside an empty old box from the move, Alina started chopping onions and garlic and measuring rice, water, and salt. She could barely concentrate. Her mind kept jumping from images of her dad in a crime-ridden country she didn't know to mommy's foreboding words to what a foster family might look like. With all that chatter in her brain, she didn't hear the doorbell ring. Alina, someone called, knocking on the front door. Alina immediately recognized the voice. It was Jenny. I've missed you, girl, Jenny said, hugging Alina tight the moment the door swung open. What are you doing here, asked Alina, and how did you find out where I lived? I asked the sisters at school, silly, said Jenny. They know we're best friends. It's been too long, and with our birthday coming up Monday, I wanted to see you. So I convinced my mom to drop me here for an hour while she runs some errands. Here, this is for you. Alina waved at Jenny's mom as she backed out of the parking space. She looked at the birthday card in her hands and lifted her gaze to meet Jenny's eyes. She smiled. Yes, it had been way too long. She pulled Jenny inside the apartment and crumpled on the sofa, tired and relieved at the same time. It was as though the months of silence between them had disappeared. The stories poured out of Alina. Alina told Jenny about public school and life without Papi, about Doña Sanchez and Mommy's words. And while both of them played with Sophie, Alina even told Jenny how she hoped her special meal would change Mommy's mind. Wow, I don't know what to say, Jenny whispered. The whole thing sucks. She hugged Alina again. I wanted so much to believe this was not happening to me, Alina said. I would have felt the same way, said Jenny. Really? I hope your plan works. Hey, want me to help set the table? When dinner time came, Alina mentioned Jenny's visit to Mummy. She described how they had decorated the rice dish together before her brothers arrived home from elementary school. Angel and Martin liked her red sun so much that they scraped up all the bits of rice stuck to the bottom of the pot. Sophie smiled at each black bean she picked up and placed in her mouth. Gracias, Alina. You made a delicious dinner, Mommy said. She looked content. So can we skip tomorrow's event? Alina asked hopefully, her plate untouched. Ay, Linda, Mommy said. Is that what this was all about? No, I mean, yes, said Alina on the edge of her seat. What are we going to do? We are still going, Alina, Mommy sighed. Eat your dinner. You barely eat anymore, Mommy added as she picked up the dishes. I'm not hungry, said Alina feeling like a pierced balloon slowly shrinking. I'll get Sophie ready for bed. The next day, a volunteer from Doña Sanchez's foundation showed up in a van early in the morning to take them to La Gran Madre's barbecue at her ranch house. On the highway, Alina stared out the window listlessly, halfway wishing something would happen so they would never reach their destination. Doña Sanchez's ranch was beautiful. After they all greeted La Gran Madre, Alina's brothers ran toward a rope swing. For a moment, Alina stood there, overwhelmed by the sounds, sights, and smells of the party. The backyard was dotted with white folding chairs next to long tables dressed in pink plastic tablecloths. Blue, pink, and yellow balloons swayed in the breeze around the huge orange deck. A donkey piñata dangled from the basketball hoop. Farther out along the row of trees, a line of excited kids waited their turn for cotton candy. There were kids sharing the contents of their goodie bags, playing with hula hoops, dancing to the salsa music, and racing one another. Alina felt like her surroundings were at odds with her feelings, and she wished for this woman to be less kind, less generous, and welcoming. Go make friends, Alina, Mommy suggested, taking Sophie in her arms and walking toward a woman she seemed to know. Looking around, Alina was sure that most of the 150 kids scattered about were American citizens like her, torn apart from a mom or dad or both. Her gaze settled on the short woman Mommy was talking with, and she recognized her as the one who would grant custody of her own children today, and the familiar knot in Alina's stomach tightened. Right after lunch, Doña Sanchez gathered the adults on the deck. She waved a white form in the air and asked for those who were interested in her guardianship to follow her inside the house. Mommy gathered her children. Alina felt her hands go clammy and held Sophie in her arms before stepping in. Two other families were seated in the living room. When it was Alina's family's turn, they walked into the dining room in silence. Mommy sat across from Doña Sanchez and a man. There were legal forms in English that Alina knew Mommy could not understand. Mommy kept saying the names of her children so Doña Sanchez could learn them, 
Alina, Angel, Martin, Sophie. Then the man explained in Spanish what the legal paper meant and slid the form toward Mommy along with a pen. Mommy took the pen and turned to look at each of her children. Sophie, Martin, Angel, Alina. Alina locked eyes with Mommy and felt Mommy's gaze melting her heart. It was as if Mommy had spoken a thousand beautiful words to her without ever opening her mouth. Mommy turned and slid the paper back to the man. I'm not ready, she said, and something broke loose within Alina. She felt like birds were ticking in her insides. She looked up and laughed, her laugh chiming like silver bells once again.